we created a whole entire new category in the probiotic space. Spores have the ability to survive the gastric system naturally. So it's not like we do any enterocoding or anything like that. They have this endospore shell around themselves that allows them to withstand the body temperature and also withstand the very acidic environment of the stomach. And when they get to the intestines, that's when they take their shell off, their endospore shell off. And that's when they go into their live vegetative cell state and where they start to work throughout the digestive system. And these strains, once they get to the intestines, they stay there for about 21 to 28 days where most probiotics out there would just simply pass through similar to food. These strains actually stay there for about 21 to 28 days, making a true change in the gut flora. Well, everybody, I get to invite and interview two pretty smart cookies on today's show. I have a research microbiologist who specializes in the human microbiome and wellness. Kieran Christian uh, is my first guest. And Kieran is joined by Tina Anderson, who actually began her career as a trial lawyer. And now she is in the probiotics industry. So as you probably have already guessed based on uh, Tina and Karan's background, we're going to be talking all things probiotics in today's show. And I have plenty of my own stupid questions about probiotics to ask you guys. So what do you think? You ready for this? I'm ready. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's do all right. it. Okay, cool. You guys are with a company called Just Thrive. I actually had some of your gummies. You have these Just Thrive gummies. I had them in my smoothie this morning, believe it or not. I, I basically every morning is a competition to see how many different things I can squeeze into a smoothie. But tell me about how Just Thrive got started. Yeah. So um, my husband, Billy, and I were in the pharmaceutical industry for several years and we thought it was great. You know, we're thinking, oh, we're, you know, delivering life-saving medications. We're making a huge change in the world, helping people feel better. But after being in the pharmaceutical industry for several years, we started to see a lot of the abuses in the industry, the overprescribing of medications that we saw with our own family members. You know, we'd see one pharmaceutical, she'd be on one. And then before you know it, she'd be on a different, 12 different medications and never getting any better. Um, and so we are really focused on mindset. We're deep thinkers. Um, and we just felt that we weren't doing our life's work. And so we, my husband was seeing a naturopathic physician who worked with Quran and through, I think, being at the right place at the right time and a lot of um, meditation, um, we were able to license these um, strains out of London University, these probiotic spores out of London University. And from there, that's where Just Thrive was born and it's been the most amazing experience I've ever, I've ever gone through in my career. How do you license a probiotic spore? How does that work? Let me touch on, you know, my my perspective on why I got into the, the probiotic industry and, and was fortunate enough to partner with Tina on it. So I, I started looking at the probiotic industry from a microbiologist's perspective, and a lot of things just didn't make any sense. Um, and then I come along and I meet this, um, you know, functional medicine doctor who has like a 95% gut practice, gut-focused practice. He he approached almost every chronic condition by dealing with the gut, and yet he didn't use a single probiotic in his practice. And that was baffling to me, right? So that was, it, it caused me to ask a lot of questions. And, and when I started asking him, why do you not use a probiotic? He was using ferments and prebiotics and lots of other things. He said, because I've tried so many of them and most of them don't really do a lot. Uh, maybe they'll do something in the beginning, but then you'll see the effects fade and all that. And, I, and it kind of resonated with me because... When I started getting into supplements and nutrition and all that for athletic purposes and for endurance and performance purposes, and I started looking at probiotics, I was like, the way they're formulating these things, packaging them, putting them in refrigerators, adding all these crazy capsules and all that, most of that doesn't make any sense. And so we wanted to rethink the idea of what a probiotic truly is and how you approach it. Uh, from a formulation perspective, and so one of one of the ways in which you you advance your um, your your project in terms of building your own proprietary probiotic is you have to find the right strains, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about what the right strain means and what it should be doing. Uh, but the, there's a lot of academic researchers that have spent a lot of time and a lot of grant money isolating strains from numerous sources. Now, for probiotics, you want to isolate strains generally from um, human, from the human gut microbiome. 
Uh, because these are strains that then have some familiarity with functioning in the gut microbiome, which is a very complex ecosystem. And so they isolate the strains, they characterize it properly, they do full genomic sequencing so we know every single protein and every single gene on those strains. And, and then they, they start to study what some of the strains' functions are. If you have connections with these academics, then you can approach them and say, hey, I know in your academic pursuits, you've isolated these strains to try to learn about them, but we'd like to commercialize them. And if you can work out a deal with them, you can basically license the mother culture, if you will, the original strain that they isolated, and then you get access to that and all of its genomic information to try to scale it into a commercial scale, a commercial strain so that you can produce it at a commercial scale. So that's the kind of deal we would do, and we did that with London University. So w when you say isolation, please don't tell me that that's just like random healthy donors pooping in a toilet bowl and the researchers collecting it with a spoon and putting in a food dehydrator or something like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is, yeah. yeah. It's, really? Uh, it's oh my collecting a lot of poop, right? So if you think about a sample of poop may have upwards of two, 3,000 different species in there. Um, and the idea is to collect maybe samples from all different parts of the world. So you get an uh, understanding of what the population distribution looks like of microbes in different people from different parts of the world. And so then you take stool um, and then you, you rehydrate it and you create a slurry and then you actually spin off uh, using centrifuges, all the bigger, more massive things like the fibers and things that didn't get digested well or absorbed. And then, and then you try to spin down what we call into pellets. These pellets are basically concentrated bacteria. Um, so you're separating all of the, the matter and the debris from the fecal uh, matter, if you will, and you're isolating the bacteria. Now, when you have these little bacterial pellets, then they start growing these bacterial pellets up in um, flasks and plates and things like that. And then you start streaking them and isolating colonies because every bacteria will have a slightly different colony. Then you pick the colonies, you do genetic sequencing, and you try to figure out what they are. So it, it is a lot of shit work, if you will, <laughs> because these, these researchers are literally dealing with pounds and pounds of shit from all over the world. And if I find a piece of like corn or carrot slice in my probiotic capsule, that means they didn't do a good job with the centrifugation. <laughs> exactly. But it's probably healthy for you. So I wouldn't be too alarmed. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's good to know that they can isolate it and grow it. And that if your guys you just thrive becomes, you know, a $10 billion company that you aren't going to run out of people pooping in order to keep up with the probiotic production. So that, that's an important one. So a lot of people have a, a misconception that when you use a, a human isolate strain, that the continuous supply of the strain continues to come from people. Um, but it's not. Once you isolate a strain and you have the original strain, the original culture, you can keep that strain indefinitely in the freezer for thousands of years. So we have the original strain that was isolated something like 15 to 20 years ago, sitting in a freezer and, and numerous um, uh, copies of that strain sitting in little tiny, um, little, little tiny vials in a freezer in minus 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And, um, and, and every time we do a production, we actually pull one of those little things and we inoculate a vessel with it and allow it to grow, and then we inoculate the next vessel and so on. So um, so it's sitting there in the freezer. We never have to go back to the human source again. That is so cool. Tina, when you came to Quran, did you already have in mind what strain that you wanted? No, we didn't. We were looking at gut health because we had learned about the importance of gut health. That was shortly after the Human Microbiome Project was launched by the National Institutes of Health, told us more about the gut than we ever knew before. And we were, we just knew we wanted to get into the gut health space, but we had talked to the functional medicine practitioner that Karan had mentioned, and he's like, the probiotics out there just aren't working. They're not working. And one day he called us into his office and he said, you will not believe this, but um, we have the opportunity to, you know, license these strains at a London university. And he's like, this is the real deal. This actually, this works. And so that's kind of how it happened. Okay. So tell me more about the strains. So they're bacillus spore strains. And one of the biggest, you know, 
differentiators of it is it's their ability to survive the gastric system. We created a whole entire new category in the probiotic space. Spores have the ability to survive the gastric system naturally. So it's not like we do any enterocoding or anything like that. They have this endospore shell around themselves that allows them to withstand the body temperature and also withstand the very acidic environment of the stomach. And when they get to the intestines, that's when they take their shell off, their endospore shell off. And that's when they turn into a live vegetative, they go into their live vegetative cell state and where they start to work throughout the digestive system. And, and these strains, once they get to the intestines, they stay there for about 21 to 28 days where most probiotics out there would just simply pass through similar to food. These strains actually stay there for about 21 to 28 days, making a true change in the gut flora. So could anybody just wander in, like like could I just start whatever, greenfieldprobiotics.com and, and go wander in and get that same strain and use it? Or are you guys able to somehow protect that at Thrive? Yeah, at Just Thrive, we're able to protect it. We have, uh, you know, a supply agreement and exclusivity and um, that, that's what we, we've been able to secure. Have you figured out a way to combine that strain with anything else that makes it more effective? Well, we have combined it with other bacillus spore strains. And um, and that's a really great question because one of the biggest problems in the industry that we're seeing is um, these kitchen sink formula to probiotics. They're where they say, you know, they have 10, 15, sometimes 20 different strains in the product and they don't know what they're doing together. That is one of the biggest things we have been trying to push in the probiotic industry is get a study on the finished formulation because these are live microorganisms. We don't know how they're going to play with each other. UC Davis did a study. Um, they took 16 children's probiotics and found that only one of them met label claims. They tested them. Only one of them met label claims. So that means 15 of them either didn't have a strain that was listed on the label or they had, even worse, they had a strain that wasn't listed on the label that nobody knew about, nobody had studied, they don't know anything about. So um, we are very proud of the fact that we've done human clinical trials on our finished formulation. What kind of stuff have you found out in your trials? Well, we did a leaky gut, a double-blind human clinical trial in leaky gut, showing that these strains are uh, reducing the LPS from leaking into the bloodstream by 42%. Um, that study was profound because we also found people who were in the placebo group actually saw a 32% increase from of LPS um, after, you know, 30 days. Yeah. And, and, and by, by the way, LPS, explain that to people who might not know what that means. Sure. Um, it stands for lipopolysaccharide. It's a toxin that's found in our gut flora. It's not really problematic. It becomes really problematic when it seeps out of your intestines and goes into your circulatory system and causes this inflammatory response. And so the leaky gut study is profound. Karan was super involved in that, um, you know, in setting that up um, with um, University of North Texas. So he could probably speak to it even more, but it is, it's a really, it's a first study that I know of. I don't know of any other probiotic or any other pharmaceutical for that matter that has a study um, on leaky gut or metabolic endotoxemia. Any other cool trials? Yeah, so we've done we've done a number, and and uh, I want to elaborate on the leaky gut study as well a little bit. Um, but some of the other trials are uh, we did a study on liver function, right? So there's this um, endohepatic circulatory and protection axis, meaning there's a deep connection between your gut microbiome and your liver, uh, and how your liver functions as a result of your microbiome. Now, what we were able to, to see in this study is that the right type of microbiome and the right type of probiotic can actually protect the liver in damage. Now, this was a, a, an animal study because you can't induce damage in liver in humans on purpose, at least. Um, you know, you can, uh, what we did is we took animals and then you, you overdose the animals in uh, acetaminophen. So th this is a, a mouse study. And then in one group of animals, we used uh, clinically graded milk thistle. Uh, and actually, which is a prescription drug in, in parts of Germany. Um, and then we used the probiotic spores, the Just Thrive spores. And what we saw was that the Just Thrive spores were able to protect the liver of the animals from damage from the overdosing of uh, acetaminophen as well and in some cases better than the milk, milk thistle did. So, so negating any of the damage from overdosing it. And that just goes to show like the intimate connection between all these other body systems and a healthy microbiome and having a healthy probiotic that facilitates a microbiome. You know, and, and the leaky gut study that Tina mentioned, the, the reason we became so interested in that is 
back in 2012, we were pondering and thinking like, okay, if we had the best probiotic there is, what would we want it to do, right? What is arguably the most important function of a probiotic? Because there's lots of things probiotics can do, right? They can alleviate gas and bloating and diarrhea or constipation, all the digestive issues. And those are all important. Uh, but what would we want to do to really move the needle in human health? And it became clear that we wanted it to resolve intestinal permeability because intestinal permeability comes about as a result of a change in the microbial environment in the gut, right? Your gut is naturally designed to not be overtly permeable. It has a dynamic permeability, meaning it allows things to go through, but then there's lots of things that it shouldn't allow to go through, including this LPS endotoxin. So when you lose that dynamic permeability and your gut becomes openly permeable, you start to get a lot of chronic low-grade inflammation, and that becomes one of the biggest sources of chronic low-grade inflammation. And as you know, that becomes the foundation for most chronic disease, right? So we saw a publication in 2015, which is a meta-analysis of this topic, and they looked at something like 30 different published human clinical trials, and they concluded that the number one cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide in the, in the developed world was intestinal permeability as a result of microbiome. Number one, right? It's the number one killer worldwide. Um, and, and it causes more mortality and morbidity than anything else worldwide because it's the foundation of so many chronic conditions like cardiovascular disease, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, diabetes, all of these things. And then the American Diabetic Association, which is normally way behind on, on advances, published a number of studies from 2013 all the way to 2018 showing that metabolic endotoxemia, that's the, the scientific definition of leaky gut, is the initial insult that starts the process of insulin resistance in the vast majority of people. So we said, okay, if we can get a handle on this issue of leaky gut, if we can give people a tool that can stop that open permeability in the microbiome, then we're really moving the needle, right, on foundational health. They still have to do all kinds of other things to be healthy, but this moves the needle. And so we did that study and we published it in a journal called the World Journal, uh, the World Journal of Pathophysiological uh, Gastroenterology. So it doesn't roll off the tongue, but it's very good for, for uh, gut nerds. Uh, and it's an open source journal, so we're able to share the study and we, we, for the first time, showed that you can actually stop and reverse this, um, this endotoxemia, right? So it was published as a frontier paper on that journal, which was really exciting to see. Man, so, so when you hear about common causes of leaky gut, like eating too fast, eating in a stressed out state, eating these hyperhedonistic combinations of like vegetable oils and sugars – the fact that you just outlined that that is the leading cause for, for all cause mortality really, I mean, really makes you think about wanting to, to chew your food thoroughly and pay attention to gut health and not eating in a stressed out state, just, just as a base foundational practice. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, overeating, uh, one of the ways of inducing endotoxemia after a meal. So they, it's pro, it's actually called postprandial endotoxemia because they measure the highest concentration of toxins in the body, and it's specifically the LPS, um, about three to four hours after the meal. And, um, and, and those meals that have, that have a very high caloric density and very high volume tend to produce a very significant amount of endotoxemia. So this is part of that overeating. Uh, and the overeating and how that drives inflammation. Now, what's the role of the toxin, right? So we, let's talk about that for a moment. So people really wrap their head around, if you're not paying attention to your, to your behaviors and your, your digestion and your gut health and your microbiome, what happens when the toxin leaks through? So LPS is really fascinating because it's very pervasive in the body. It can get into almost any tissue in the body. And the reason it can is because it looks like our lipid bilayer, right? So it's got this like fatty acid tail on it and it's got this carbohydrate head, very similar to that lipid bilayer that makes up all our cell membranes. So it can just scoot its way into almost any cell, almost any tissue. After a meal, you find LPS in deep recesses in the brain, like the hypothalamus, the frontal cortex, you find it in your liver, you find it in your joints, you find it in your heart and your pericardium. So you find it in all these different areas of the body and wherever it ends up, 
it elicits a very profound immune response. Now, the reason it elicits a, a profound immune response is because your immune system is designed to monitor and detect the presence of LPS because to your immune system, the presence of LPS means that there are pathogens entering into the blood circulation. And the reason is that because LPS is made generally by gram-negative bacteria. Some people may have heard of gram-negative bacteria, a lot of them being pathogens. So your immune system is constantly monitoring for gram-negative bacteria entering into your system. And it has a protein called LBP, LPS binding protein, that it makes and sends out to look for LPS throughout the body. Wherever LBP finds LPS, it binds it, it activates macrophages and dendritic cells and causes those cells to go crazy and go, holy crap, we've got a bunch of um, gram-negative bacteria in this region, like your brain, for example, your heart, and it recruits a massive amount of immune cells to that area that elicit an innate immune response. That's a cytokine-like storm that a lot of people heard about during COVID. So imagine these cytokine-like storms happening in your brain, in your heart, in your muscles, in your joints after you eat a meal, right? If you eat really bad fats, you eat oxidized fats, you eat really high calories, you eat too fast, like you said, um, you know, and just overly processed foods that, that have a lot of pesticides and herbicides, all of those things are driving this postprandial response. And if it keeps happening, meal after meal after meal, day after day, week after week, and so on, it sets up the foundation for disease, right? So this is so profound and so important, and, and people just don't wrap their heads around it. And, and this is where the importance of those basic behaviors comes from. Well, we've established that the most likely time of my life that I'm going to die then is going to be about 4 p.m. on Thanksgiving afternoon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for a lot of people, right? <laughs> that checks, that yeah. checks all those boxes. You know, I've been learning a lot about the the teeth and the jaw and the biomechanical structure of bite and also oral health. And my dentist, who's been on the show before, Dr. Nico Loud down in Phoenix, she does salivary enzyme analysis of some of these gram-negative bacteria because of the association between your mouth bacteria and Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. I'm, I'm assuming for many of the reasons that you've just described, because these then wind up in the gut, being absorbed through the buccal membrane and winding up yep. in the bloodstream. But, but could you make a case, you know, Tina, you were talking about how the capsule can survive the, the gastric environment. I'm wondering if you could make a case for actually, for example, break up breaking open a couple of capsules and kind of mouthwashing to to start that population in in the oral environment. Have you guys ever thought about that? Yes. So we, we've actually do we do that quite a bit in clinics. Uh, and we recommend it quite a bit for uh, people, especially during the cold and flu season, because there's a lot of association with the buccal um, immune response, because there's a lot of immune tissue in the soft tissue in your mouth. And it upregulates uh, protective immune uh, response in your upper respiratory tract, in your lower respiratory tract, and so on. Um, so the spores do play a role there. Even, even Dr. Simon Cutting, almost 15 years ago, when we first started working with him on the spores, he always recommended taking some spores, mixing it in water, swishing it in your mouth and holding it, and then swallowing that. So yeah, I, you're right on the right track. There's a, there's a huge advantage to doing that. I would do that kind of thing before bed, and I, and I often do it, um, because a lot of what's happening, especially people who are mouth breathers and who tend to struggle with that issue, right? You want to have some sort of protection in your oral cavity. I also do it a lot during cold and flu season um, because that really helps upregulate some of the immune response. And the spores are really good at something called quorum sensing. This is one of the ways in which it helps against gram negatives and it helps against leaky gut is they have the ability to read other microbial signatures. So they can identify dysfunctional bacteria like Enterococcus. That's a type of gram negative bacteria that ten tends to be found in the mouth. It can identify enterococcus and elicit, cause your immune system to elicit an immune response against the presence of enterococcus. So releasing more secretory IgA that neutralizes the bacteria or even directly getting the immune system to go after that bacteria or the spores themselves will directly negate and kill off that bacteria, right? So we've seen mm -hmm. that and we've published a couple studies on the ability of the spores to do this quorum sensing. That's a really important thing. Now you can use it on your skin. You can mix it in with lotion. You can put it on your skin. 
the spores are ubiquitous in the environment and we've evolved to actually have this ongoing relationship with them where they're transient to our body. They show up, they clean up different uh, systems, and then they leave again and go back into the environment. So here's something that that I'm interested in based on what Kieran was explaining about acetaminophen and liver injuries. You know, T and I know you're kind of a fellow health enthusiast and do some biohacking and stuff like that. You and I have had a glass of wine before at some of these conferences and health events that we're at. Have you ever kind of tried it prior to maybe a cocktail and a glass of wine and, and assessed how you feel afterwards as an N equals one? Or have you guys seen anything done on alcohol and these specific strains? Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I do it all the time, you know, when when I'm going to drink. I mean, I, I mean, I'll have, I usually have my probiotics every time at the same day. But then, you know, if I'm going to go out and I know I'm going to have a glass of wine or two, then I will ha- I'll take extra for that reason. Exactly. And I also take our IgG product, which is an immunoglobulin G that um, we don't want to distract the attention of what we're talking about today. But that's another great product that I take before before I'm going to um, engage in any alcoholic consumption. Isn't that the same type of stuff you can find in colostrum, the IgG? Actually, it's way more. Um, I mean, IgG. Yes, IgG is found in classroom, but the IgG that we work with actually has a twenty-five to fifty percent more IgG than most common colostrums out there. Oh wow! So for the leaky gut scenario, that could be a one-two combo if you take that and then the lactobacillus strain at the same time. The bacillus, the bacillus spore strain. For the bacillus spore strains, yeah, interesting. And, and in fact, there have been, you know, one of the things we really liked about the IgG is um, in, in the condition of HIV, there's this, there's this uh, mark thing that happens called HIV enteropathy. Uh, and this was actually a, a, a large scale published study by the NIH that showed that the, the biggest um, um, thing that affects HIV patients in terms of progression from being HIV positive to AIDS is the, the development of leaky gut. Right. And and part of it is because the virus attacks the gut and gut, gut lining. It uh, it, of course, kills off the CD4 positive T cells. It causes CD8 cells to come in and start fighting it. And those CD8 cells are very inflammatory. So that destroys the lining of the gut. It makes the gut very, very leaky in HIV patients. So they have leaky gut in a very profound manner. Right. So it's a very accelerated, profound model for leaky gut. It's a very similar pathology that occurs in people with just poor lifestyle choices and lots of antibiotics and you're common American, right? Uh, but it's a, it's a good model to study accelerated uh, decimation of lining of the gut. They did studies on the IgG and we worked with them with the spores and the IgG. And, and what they were able to show with the IgG is even in that condition of accelerated leaky gut damage, um, that they were able to start to repair some of that lining. So the combination is a powerful one-two punch because it work a little bit differently. Uh, and it's a, it's a great way of continuous protection on the lining of the gut. And, and the liver thing, you know, um, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot because I do enjoy a cocktail uh, from time to time and some really nice high-end spirits. Um, and when you think about, okay, liver protection, how do you negate some of the negative effects of alcohol? We know that, that a lot of the negative effects of alcohol comes from the formation of acetaldehyde. Right. And acetaldehyde can be very inflammatory. So I have two thoughts in mind. Number one is, okay, what drives some of the acetaldehyde production? There is some evidence that a dysfunctional microbiome actually produces more acetaldehyde than a, than a more diverse um, uh, microbiome. And so there, there is a, a, a small case to be made with early evidence that the spores may be able to help with, some, with lowering some of that acetaldehyde. Uh, number two is the inflammation associated with the uh, acetaldehyde and clearing it. That's where the liver comes in and that's where all the flushing and all the, the disturbances to the rest of the body. The spores are anti-inflammatory and they're profoundly anti-inflammatory. And this is a very important uh, distinction between different types of probiotics. You know, we, it'd, be, it'd be surprising to, un- to learn that a huge number of well-known probiotic strains are actually inflammatory. Uh, really? but that's exactly what was shown. Yeah, and this is uh, and this is a fascinating thing where there was anecdotal evidence, and then I and then I was able to work with researchers at University of uh, University College Cork in in Cork, Ireland, one of the biggest microbiome research uh, institutes in the world. Um, and what what they were able to show is that 
the mass, vast majority of probiotic strains that are widely used, that they tested, when you take them, they elicit a huge uh, spectrum of, of immune responses, including three different mechanisms of systemic inflammation, right? So they upregulate inflammation. Your body sees these strains coming in. They don't necessarily recognize them. And as a result, the immune system gets fired up. Now, here's the thing. For a healthy individual that is trying to ward off colds and flus and things like that, you just want your immune system kind of irritated and upregulated so that in case you encounter a virus or something like that, it, it deals with it faster. That may be a benefit. For the vast majority of people that are dealing with health conditions, with inflammatory conditions, it actually can make it worse. Right, right. It, it, it'd be similar to like if you have chronic fatigue or stress issues, the same uh, ice bath practice that might help some people develop cellular resilience and stress resilience would kind of push you overboard. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And so when you look, when you work, and I, I have the pleasure of working with lots and lots of functional medicine practitioners. I have a whole other thing that I do in the functional medicine world. Um, and what, what I've come to find out is that a lot of holistic health functional medicine practitioners don't use any probiotics for their mast cell activation patients, their SIBO patients, their histamine intolerant patients, you know, people with all kinds of sensitivities, because these people tend to have a proclivity towards inflammation. And in their experiences, most probiotics make it worse. And now we have the answer. We go, ah, that's because most of these probiotics, you wouldn't think, but they upregulate inflammation. Now, the spores are what we call in the, in the probiotic research world, silent probiotics. That, that means that they don't upregulate any of the pro-inflammatory pathways. In fact, they upregulate the anti-inflammatory pathways in the body. And that's a really, really important distinction between different probiotics. This is where I get nervous when I see kitchen sink formulas with 15 strains in them and no research behind what the immune impact is, what the microbiome impact is, and so on, because many of those, especially in their combinations, could be quite inflammatory. So when you hear about people getting gas and bloating and sometimes a deleterious response to a probiotic, paradoxical because they thought it might help their gut, you're saying that it might not be due to what I kind of always thought was the case, right? Like throwing off the microbial balance in a way that causes gastric upset, but it may actually be inducing an inflammatory response. That's right. Yeah, it could be inducing an inflammatory response in the lining of their gut, um, just like a food that they may not be tolerant to would, right? If someone's intolerant to a particular type of food, say dairy, they can't tolerate dairy while they eat dairy, they're going to get gas, bloating, loose stool, and so on. Now, there's a, there's a small sliver where, where there are certain people that might ex experience something called a Herxheimer reaction, right? A die-off reaction or uh, naturopaths will call it like a healing crisis. Um, that is a change that's happening that's positive, but has a negative symptom in the beginning. And normally you work through that for, you know, two or three days. But if you're taking the kitchen sink probiotics and the stuff that just doesn't have clinical studies behind the finished product, and you're having a negative effect as a result of it, you could probably lean towards the idea that, okay, this is just not agreeing with my system. It's upregulating too much inflammation, and it's probably not doing me any good. The, the, the qualitative way to differentiate between the two, inflammation versus some kind of a Herxheimer reaction and die off of bad bacteria, I assume would be the length of time of the symptoms, a few days versus, say, several weeks. But I suppose from a quantitative standpoint, could you actually get like a like an inflammation marker test and see if you actually had higher levels of homocysteine or interleukin or something like that? And that would give you a pretty big clue that your probiotic might have contributed to an inflammatory spike. Yeah. So um, IL-6 would be one that would be good to check. Um, if you have a big spike of IL-6 uh, after using a probiotic, that generally means that, the, that you're immune system doesn't agree with that probiotic and it's not really helping you. Uh, but if you have, for example, some die-off like reactions, but your IL-6 isn't elevated, and then on top of that, you might see uh, interleukin-10 and uh, elevated, that means the probiotic's actually going to work trying to induce an anti-inflammatory response. But what is actually causing the discomfort is the microbes, the dysfunctional microbes that are present in your gut trying to fight against the presence of that probiotic. 
right? This is why they call it a die-off response. Um, but like the spores, for example, when they go in, one of the first things they're going to do into your gut is they'll do quorum sensing. You mean you you mean you mean the bacillus spores that that are that's in the just thrive stuff. That's exactly right. Yeah, the bacillus spores that are that are in the just thrive when they first enter into the gut, what they do is they start reading the microbial environment. When they when they identify dysfunctional bacteria, they'll sit next to them and they'll produce antimicrobials or they'll elicit an immune response to try to get rid of those particular bacteria. Now, those bacteria when they're being killed off will release a bunch of toxins. And those toxins can feel like discomfort in certain people. And, and so that's a, a die-off reaction versus the probiotic coming in, your immune system going, I don't know what this is, let's just attack it, and then attacking it and causing a bunch of systemic inflammation in the individual. That will happen over and over again for a probiotic that's in, incompatible to an individual. The die-off response will go away in a day or two after those dysfunctional microbes are gone from the system. So here's something I'm curious about. When it comes to antibiotics, some people say take a probiotic when you start an antibiotic regimen to help to replenish what you're killing off. Some people say it doesn't have any benefit. And now I'm seeing research that suggests that probiotics might actually slow down the recovery of the gut microbiome after antibiotics. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, that's the, I think the Weissman Institute study that recently came out, um, telling us that, yeah, like some of these, the kitchen sink formula type probiotics that we're talking about will actually compete with your gut flora and actually hinder your own immune cells to actually fight off the, you know, effects of the antibiotic. And so um, one of the things that we're so excited about with the spores that we studied is it actually, you know, we are huge believers that you should be taking a spore-based probiotic while you're on an antibiotic. We've studied this. We know that the spores actually survive the presence of an antibiotic, which is huge. They actually, you know, will not be killed off by the presence of an antibiotic. We've studied this with some of the strongest antibiotics out there. Um, but, and we know that these are, these spores are not competing with our natural gut flora. They're actually working, you know, together with them, um, cohesively. So, um, but yeah, that Weissman study was kind of interesting because it told us that, you know, this is what we've been preaching for years. You know, we don't want to be, we have to be careful when you're taking these, you know, uh, multi-strain probiotics without a study on the finished product. So the study that showed that probiotics could hinder the recovery from antibiotics from a gut microbiome standpoint, they were using like a multi-strain formulation. Was it like an off-the-shelf or were they just using a, a random set of strains that they had at Wiseman Lab? Or do you know? So, so what they did is they actually um, uh, bought strains from a, from a data bank that are commonly used probiotic strains. So, you know, your um, acidophilus and those types of strains that are typically found in a probiotic. And they assembled a formulation that mimicked your average multi-strain probiotic on the marketplace. They didn't want to go and buy any given commercial product. What they were trying to do is kind of create one that, that was a representation of your typical generic probiotic combination. Um, now, the, what's, what's really important to note here is, and this, this, this particular study tells a really important story about understanding why probiotics are different, right? So um, when, you, when you think about a probiotic strain or things that people call probiotic strains, there are really two distinctions. Number one is, um, it's, is it a resident strain naturally? Is it a naturally a resident strain to the gut or is it a transient strain to the gut? Now, probiotics in general should be transient strains because transient strains have a way of coming in, interacting with the microbiome, with the immune system, doing positive things, and then leaving because your job is not to stay there and take up space. Right now, when you take probiotics that are actually resident strains and try to uh, put them into your system, they're going to go in and compete with your other resident strains. Yeah, that makes it. It'd be like having a plumber who I wanted to come over and clean my toilet and then leave when they're done, versus you know them setting up shop in the master bedroom closet with a sleeping bag, and you know it it, it vastly changed my lifestyle one versus the other. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and that, that's exactly right. And, and the thing about it is that what happens to the gut microbiome when you take an antibiotic is uh, with the first dose of the antibiotic, within about uh, 90 minutes or so, it knocks down almost all the strains 
in your in your gut microbiome down to just a few cells of each strain, right? So the volume of bacteria drops down quite dramatically, which means there's now a lot of real estate open for microbes to start taking over binding sites and campsites and so on. Now, the bacteria start to grow back, right? That's that's the beauty of bacteria is you can't kill them off completely. They're going to start to grow back. But what grows back and in what proportion is where you start to see the dysfunction. Now, what happens is if if those get knocked down, then you take 15 billion of these other resident strains from other sources those 15 billion are going to start competing for binding sites with your own resident strains that are trying to grow back. That's where we see the big problem. That's why, to me, when I think about this as a microbiologist, I'm like, the best probiotics and the the safest ones are always going to be transient strains, because that's actually how we interact with microbes in the natural environment. All of the microbes we come across in the natural environment, whether it's in the dirt or you know, rivers and streams or fruits that we uh, we forage for and pick and so on, or microbes that we get from each other that we interact with are going to be transient in your system. They're going to go in, they're going to be that plumber, they're going to fix a thing or two, and then they're going to leave when they're done, right? That's really what you want at the end of the day. No, we we are able now to, to test our gut. You know, I recently did a Genova three-day stool panel, which kind of tells you parasites and yeast and fungus and some bacterial balance. There are other companies like, uh, you know, like a uh, Viome, for example, that are doing these bacterial profiles of the biome. Why can't you look at the results of a test like that and literally like customize the type of bacteria that you're replenishing based on what each person's unique biome is? And based on that, like, how do you know that one specific strain is going to be good or bad for just the general population? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that that is the um, the ultimate goal of microbiome science is can we get to a place where we can look at uh, an individual's microbiome and understand what they need specifically? Now we're not there yet, and it's for this reason. the The reason is that at the species level, right? So if you look at bacteria, we've got you know uh, everything that lives ha- it starts with kingdom, order, and all that, and everyone knows that there's genus and species, right? So um, just for people that may not be familiar, so if we take Lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, or in our case, Bacillus subtilis, the, the Lactobacillus or the Bacillus is the genus, and then the specific species is the uh, subtilis or acidophilus, right? So in humans, it's we're Homo sapiens sapiens, so we're the same almost genus and species. Now, what we what we don't know yet is why at the species level, we are all vastly different in our microbiomes, right? So, so you and I, Ben, could have, you know, maybe 25% similarity in our, at the species level, in our microbiomes. And yet, we may have 98% the same functionality out of our microbiomes. Now, the reason for that is because um, there's a lot of functional redundancies among bacteria, right? Like I may have a certain set of bacteria that's producing short chain fatty acids for me and it's doing it at the right levels. You may have a slightly different set of bacteria, but they're still producing short chain fatty acids. So both of us have preserved that function of producing short chain fatty acids. You just have different players that are doing it than me, right? So at the species level, it becomes very complicated to understand how to modulate the microbiome. So when you look at the microbiome and you look at at function rather than species population, that's where we can start to make changes. Now, the other problem is a given individual's microbiome can have up to a thousand, two thousand species in it. The vast majority of those species have never really been isolated well and they're not available from a commercial standpoint to repopulate the gut, right? So most probiotics, as people are familiar with, have bifidobacteria, lactobacillus as genuses, and then in our case, we have bacillus. Just looking at those, that makes up 99% of the probiotics out there. That's only three genuses out of thousands that could exist in an individual's gut, right? So if we look at an individual's gut and we go, oh my God, they're missing you know, this particular genus, well, there's no source of that genus out there to replace, uh, to replenish that individual's gut. So then you have to really look at how do we upregulate the endogenous level of that bacteria. This is where transient microbes come into play. As it turns out, one of the things that the bacillus spores can do is they can naturally help 
some of the underrepresented, uh, underrepresented genuses and species in the gut replenish themselves by producing compounds that those particular bacteria feed off of, right? So we saw, we did a study where we published a study showing that when you add bacillus endospores to your gut microbiome, it increases the diversity of all species by almost 30%. Right. So species that were there at such low levels that we could barely detect them, they're now flourishing. Right. We've all heard of acromantia. Acromantia is becoming so important now and people are starting to understand, you know, the benefits of acromantia, your endogenous acromantia, especially. We did a study where we showed that um, we can add bacillus subtilis in and the Just Thrive probiotic combination. And in individuals where acromantia was not detectable because it was at such low levels, we were able to see a thousand fold increase in as little as three weeks. So what do you what, what do you think would happen if I started breaking open a couple of the Just Thrive bacillus spores and putting them into my yogurt before I ferment the yogurt? Do you think it would help with the growth of the other bacterial strains in the yogurt? It will. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, bacillus is used quite a bit for fermentation. Uh, part of it is because bacillus will acidify the environment. They will produce lactic acid. The acidified um, components will actually help some of the beneficial bacteria grow and prevent the growth of yeast and mold and so on. They will also produce a number of peptides, and these peptides actually help other beneficial bacteria grow. That's one of the ways in which they do it in the gut. So, so we, we had for a while some recipes of fermenting fruits, for example, with the bacillus. One of the things you can do that's simple is take a uh, mason jar um, and fill the bottom third of the mason jar with any kind of fruit that has sugar in it, so pineapples, berries, and so on, and then the rest of it with water. You open a capsule of, of Just Thrive, you put it in the mason jar, stir it up, and then uh, seal it shut. And then leave it on your on your kitchen counter for three or four days. You'll start to see some bubbles forming in there, and you're basically getting a fermented fruit juice that now has high, even higher nutritional value because there are organic acids, there are peptides, there are all kinds of wonderful things in there now, and it tastes good, right? So you can absolutely do that as well as a side. You might have just saved me a bunch of money on my water kefir grains from making that countertop <laughs> fizzy water kefir. That's I'm gonna have to try this, Tina. You guys need to do a, a cookbook too. Yeah, well, we do send out recipes on our blog. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, now, kind of a logistical question. You know, it's like 100 degrees outside right now. What happens if I order from your company and it arrives and, like, the bottle's hot? Yeah, it's that's not a problem at all. These spores are so hardy that they're able to withstand. We've tested them up to 455 degrees. They will withstand heat of up to 455 degrees, if not hotter. Uh, but we actually tested it at 455 degrees. So um, that's not a problem. We get that question all the time. But you could open the capsules and mix them with food and bake with them. You know, if your kids are picky or a spouse is picky or somebody doesn't want to take them, you could actually bake with them. So they are. that's how hardy they are. That's the same ability that they have to survive the presence of an antibiotic. They actually, that shell on them actually allows them to survive the high temperatures and low temperatures as well. That's, that's actually going to surprise a lot of people, including me, that you can get them that hot. That's actually pretty cool. You might think this is uh, interesting, Ben. The uh, the oldest bacillus spore that's been found uh, was found in a, a cave in California. So if people aren't familiar, what, what's, what's happening is that we're, we're approaching this post-antibiotic world, right? Because of overuse of antibiotics, a lot of the pathogens have developed resistance to antibiotics, and that's a very scary thing. If you get, for example, a MRSA infection where, where no, no uh, antibiotics can help you, um, so what researchers are doing is they're going deep into caves that have never been explored, looking for bacteria that may make a unique antibiotic that we haven't even thought of um, to be able to try to utilize it to create the next generation of antibiotics. Because again, all antibiotics originally came from yeast, mold, and other bacteria. So they were going in these caves in Southern California, and they found these salt crystals um, and then they were able to melt down salt crystals and isolate bacillus endospores from the salt crystals, and they were still alive. Those microbes were 250 million years old sitting there, right? 250 million years old, still alive. Um, and they, they've pulled out bacillus endospores from glacial ice cores that were 40, 50 million years old. And there's a study showing that bacillus subtilis, one of our key strains that are, that are in the formulation, um, can survive in the vacuum of outer space for over seven years and maybe one of the earliest forms of life on Earth 
because there's this concept of panspermia where um, the, the, the fundamental building blocks of cells were seeded uh, on Earth during the bombardment period uh, from meteors and all from outer space because they find proteins and amino acids and all that on meteors. And so they looked at microbes that exist today that could have made a journey on a meteorite across from, say, Mars um, and landed on Earth. And they found that the solar subtilis is one of the few that could have made that interstellar journey. So these are phenomenal organisms, right? And they're all around us. And you just have, in our case, we kept thinking we're just smart enough to figure out what nature already has for us. We're not trying to recreate nature. We just have to know what, uh, what, the, what she has for us and how to utilize it and how to put it back into our system. Hey, you talked about for the oral microbiome, maybe putting a little bit of the broken up capsule and swishing around the mouth prior to sleep, but could probiotics help with sleep, do you think, or these specific spores help with sleep? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know that there's that the gut brain access. And so, so much of what's going on in your brain is affected by what's going on in your gut. So we see that all the time. So many people will come to the product because of the common digestive reasons, you know, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. And then, you know, three months into it, they're like, I'm sleeping better. Oh, I have more energy or I better weight management. We see that a lot too, but it just makes so much sense. If you're going to the bathroom more regularly and you're getting rid of toxins and, and if you're taking care of all those neurotransmitters that are in your gut. 90% of our serotonin is produced in our gut. GABA is produced in our gut. Dopamine is produced in our gut. So all of these important neurotransmitters are helping us. And, and definitely we see that all the time. People have improved sleep from it. Didn't you send me something that says calm on the label? Did you just put other stuff in it that also helps with sleep? Yes. So our Just Calm product is a psychobiotic. So a psychobiotic, it basically is the friendly bacteria that's supporting that gut brain access. And um, that's a strain called Bifidal longum 1714 that has eight clinical trials on it um, about how it, it, it basically has shown to balance out cortisol. So lowering cortisol levels, um, lowering your perception of stress, even changing your brainwave activity. So putting you more in that theta wave state where you're calmer, more in that like meditative state, um, not where you're, you can't function, but it's just where you're more focused. And um, so it, it, the studies on that product are amazing. And, and obviously we've had a ton of success with it because we've seen some great results. Well, this is super interesting. You know, I know there's a lot of research studies and a, a lot of a lot of uh, a, a lot of product information that you guys have on Just Thrive. I got to check out these recipes, by the way. I had no clue you were putting those out. But what I'm going to do is is for the show notes, they're going to be for everybody listening in at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Just Thrive Podcast. That's bengreenfieldlife.com slash Just Thrive Podcast. I'll link to the Just Thrive stuff. We've got discount codes. I'll put studies in there, other podcasts that I've done on the biome. Uh, Tina and Karan, anything else you guys want to throw in? Thank you for bringing up that um, that link. Uh, we have a coupon code for 20% off for uh, the 90-day product because I just feel so passionately that when you do the 90 days, you, that's when you start to see all the magic happen. When you start taking care of your gut and you start seeing the difference, it takes about that time to start seeing the magic happen. So the code is Ben for 20% off. So yeah. And just, you know, give yourself grace along the way as you're going through your gut healing journey. One of the things I want to say is that um, gut health, and I think most people listening are probably in tune with this, but gut health is so paramount to, to overall health and wellness and longevity. Uh, when you think about gut health and what is the healthiest marker of your microbiome, and with, based on all the studies that have been published out there over the last 10 years, uh, and we're talking, you know, probably two or 300,000 studies on the microbiome, um, the, the really key foundational thing is diversity in the microbiome. The higher the diversity of your gut microbiome, the longer you live, the more resilient you are to disease, you know, the more cocktails you can enjoy without all the negative effects, the, the, the better your muscles function, the better you, you, you perform in every single way. And so maintaining and increasing diversity is a critical step in, in having really true foundational health. And the thing is, when you look at all of these listed known healthy behaviors, like eating healthy foods, being outside, exercise, meditation, all of these things have been shown to actually increase the diversity of your gut microbiome. Another thing that really helps with maintaining and increasing diversity is taking the right probiotic. 
but you need a probiotic that has the ability to impact the rest of the microbiome, is transient in that way, and, and is designed by nature to improve the diversity of your gut microbiome. That's where these bacillus endospores come in. So we're super excited to be to have been working with these for like 10 years now, uh, and, and we'll continue to work with them and put out more studies and more information. That's awesome. If you heard that part about diversity and you're listening in, that means if your idea of your vegetable intake is the all too common cucumber, carrot, tomato, lettuce, and maybe throw in some chicken and rice, then um, uh, read my cookbooks <laughs> or, or yeah. branch out yeah. wide variety of herbs, spices, fruits, vegetables, fermented foods, meats. And that's going to back up the use of these type of spores that we've talked about. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much. And again, for those of you listening in, the show notes are at bengreenfieldlife.com slash just thrive podcast 20 percent code that tina mentioned for that 90 day supply is ben and have an incredible week do you want free access to comprehensive show notes my weekly roundup newsletter cutting edge research and articles top recommendations from me for everything that you need to hack your life and a whole lot more check out ben greenfield life.com it's all there ben greenfield life.com see you over there most of you who listen don't subscribe, like, or rate this show. If you're one of those people who do, then a huge thank you. But here's why it's important to subscribe, like, and or rate this show. If you do that, that means we get more eyeballs. We get higher rankings. And the bigger the Ben Greenfield Life show gets, the bigger and better the guests get, and the better the content I'm able to deliver to you. So hit subscribe, leave a ranking, leave a review if you got a little extra time. It means way more than you might think. Thank you so much.